As you arrive at the final installment of Star Wars Visions, having witnessed fresh spins on old characters, explosive action sequences, new cultures, the reforging of lightsabers, and hopeful beginnings, comes Akakiri. It has none of those things. Akakiri is something else entirely. In its first frame, it both insists on itself as a Star Wars story and rejects that notion simultaneously. The story is something that long predates the franchise in terms of its inspiration and yet recontextualizes the works of George Lucas. It is a breathing contradiction, the least Star Wars of all of the Visions projects and yet somehow the most Star Wars. And while its placement at the end of an anthology that celebrates Star Wars seems odd, I can't help but find something enrapturing about it. What struck me most about that first moment in Akakiri was the duality between what I was seeing and what I was hearing. A crashing spaceship, specifically a B-Wing, and a drawn lightsaber is an instant statement of, yes, this is Star Wars, we've got all of your important visual indicators right here. But what you hear in those moments is the opposite. Yu Zan is the composer for the soundtrack to Akakiri, and he's a tabla player, which are hand drums. And they are about as far from the sweeping orchestral soundtracks of John Williams as humanly possible. You're not going to find any non-percussion instrumentation here. There are no horns, no violins, no woodwinds. And while I dig the music in this short and have been listening to a Yuzan performance with Rei Harakami on repeat, link in the description, there's no denying that the tonal contrast musically to what one would likely consider to be quote unquote Star Wars music is incredibly sharp more so than all of the other projects. Sure, some of them included traditional Japanese instruments in lieu of what Williams used, but they were filling the same space as the instruments that got left behind. This is a total departure from the kinds of sounds you're used to hearing in Star Wars projects. There's no orchestration at all. It helps to make Akakiri feel more grounded and less like a space epic, a bit more brutal and messy. The few vocals, like in the first fight scene, are more rhythmic chanting than the choir you'd generally expect. Yet, those same things that make it different and cool are also the very elements that make it feel discordant. And I find that to be important because Akakiri needs to distance itself from Star Wars in order to tell one of the most Star Wars stories, because Star Wars already told it in a very different way. In this 12 minute short, a reference to destiny comes up six times explicitly and three times more implicitly. The predestined vision plays three times, which at a reference to runtime ratio is a flat one to one. Akakiri is, needless to say, talking about fate. And it does this in the most Star Wars way imaginable, by telling the story of a Jedi who has a vision that they want to prevent from happening, and yet in their desire to prevent that from happening, ensure that it does, killing the woman they love and turning to the dark side. Yes, Akakiri is retelling Revenge of the Sith, but I find that the lack of context in which one watches Akakiri makes all the difference. Akakiri doesn't feel like Revenge of the Sith. As I said, it doesn't really feel like any of the Star Wars stories we've watched before in this anthology or in the films. It is the story of a Jedi traveling with a princess to try and reclaim her palace alongside two guards, a party of four on their way to confront the Sith who killed her father. Tsubaki, the Jedi, and Misa, the princess, have a history from years ago, and most of the opening minutes are spent having the guides play comedic relief. Throughout the piece, Tsubaki has visions of someone dying in front of him, becoming clear that he's killing the masked individual as time progresses, and Tsubaki is obsessed with preventing this. When taking a shortcut in which one of the guides disappears, the other guide says that they were destined to die there, which Tsubaki denies and rushes back to save them, decrying predestination. He successfully saves them, suggesting that he is able to subvert destiny, but the vision he has upon reuniting the team shows that his fated path is still very much in play. We as an audience do not know, as they enter the palace, whether Tsubaki's fate will go the way of Oedipus Rex or Disney's Hercules, whether he will succumb to destiny or overthrow it, but in the face of the Sith Lord, he doesn't stand much of a chance. It is a short, unsatisfying fight sequence. Misago, the Sith who killed her brother the king, has such a cool design and radiates power through her frame as opposed to the thin Tsubaki. Misago, authority in her voice, declares that it is his destiny to join her on the dark side. And in his anger, he fulfills the vision he so desperately wanted to avoid, killing Misa who was thrust into the fight by Misago. In order to save her, he joins Misago, becoming her apprentice, saving Misa but then walking away from her, ending Akakiri. The parallels to Revenge of the Sith are obvious, but as I said, context matters a lot. 
Watching Revenge of the Sith, assuming you're watching the films in release order, you already know Anakin's destiny. You've gone into the prequel films knowing full well that Darth Vader exists and that he is Anakin, and that in Return of the Jedi, he'll be redeemed, at least in the eyes of the Force. So we as an audience have foreknowledge that Anakin is going to turn to the dark side, and it becomes increasingly obvious that the vision of Padme's death is the catalyst in Episode 3. Revenge of the Sith and technically all of the prequels, is a procession to an end that was laid out decades beforehand. The dramatic irony of each moment is not lost on the viewer. Akakiri has no such inevitability until it happens. Destiny feels so much more heartbreaking because we as an audience weren't clued in beforehand that it was inevitable. The story even teases us with the saving of the guy who is destined to die, but it is for naught. And arguably worse, we don't know what happens in Tsubaki or Misa's futures. Anakin's fall is in the context of his later redemption. His story is written, but here we have nothing to go on. Destiny is cruel on the micro level in both stories, but it is far more cruel when you don't have the later context. And so while the Star Wars films might have a positive take on Destiny, that everything in the end works out, Akakiri focuses its scope onto this moment where all we have is the fall, and a princess who watches her friend who became a Sith to save her, and the woman who killed her father walk away. Akakiri, and therefore this anthology, ends not on a hopeful note, but one of despair, in a red sky where there is no guarantee that everything will be made all right in the end. But I don't have to end this video on a downer, so let's wrap this up with some other cool stuff that's happening in this project. I love the transition to red in the color palette as the corrupting forces of the dark side become more and more enticing, not only in regard to saving Misa, but also in regard to power and their flashback conversations about stability and peace. The brief cut to his master on this gray-blue palette to be completely overshadowed by the dark reds is awesome. The characterization of Tsubaki is maybe not the best Jedi ever since he judges people based on appearances is something that Yoda chides Luke over in Empire. And I would be remiss to not point out the fact that this story is basically a reinterpretation of Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress, which served as inspiration for A New Hope in regard to substance, the use of C-3PO and R2-D2 as the characters we follow in the opening being the analogs of the peasants in Fortress, as well as the style. Lucas's eye is very much inspired by Kurosawa's cinematography. This is a cool instance of a franchise that took inspiration and cues from another source, incorporating a modified version of the original into the franchise which to me is super cool and the only examples I can think of are easter eggs in video games and nothing as substantive as this. It's a cool legacy moment. Star Wars has far more global cultural relevance than any of Kurosawa's films, but with Akakiri the influence is front and center, a reminder of the Hidden Fortress's impact on this franchise. I don't know whether Akakiri is the most or least Star Wars project in Visions, it doesn't really matter. What I do know is that the production is impressive in how it reconsiders and recontextualizes the world of Star Wars in story, aesthetics, and its ancestry, and that, if nothing else, deserves your attention. This is the final part in the Star Wars AnyTube anthology on Visions. Thanks for making it all the way to the end, or if this is where you started, go click the playlist on your screen to catch the rest by incredibly talented creators who each took a short. And from all of us, may the Force be with you.